I'd like to begin by uh, respectfully acknowledging that I'm actually on a uh, Treaty 6 territory in Ca uh, Canada. Amiskwachi uh, Wasco, uh, sorry, Amiskwachi, Amiskwachi Waskahican. And I respectfully acknowledge that I perform most of my research and my science communication here from Treaty 6 territory in Canada. Um, and this territory was the traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, the Blackfoot, Mati, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishinaabe, Intuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. I'd also like to start by talking about the general fact that I'm a multi-wavelength astronomer. So when astronomers talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, most of us are used to visible light. But in fact, there are all sorts of other ways we can explore the electromagnetic spectrum. We can use satellites to explore X-ray emission. Typical telescopes give us visible light. We can look into the infrared, either from the ground, but increasingly from space, as I'll talk a little bit about tonight. We even go into very long wavelengths, like submillimeter telescopes, or even arrays of radio telescopes. Most of my focus today is going to be on four regimes, the centimeter, the submillimeter, the micron, and the nanometer regime, X-rays, mid-infrared, submillimeter, and radio. I'd also like to say that this is actually work that's being done by multiple different teams. And for those of you who aren't used to professional astronomy, it's increasingly a very collaborative environment. Uh, with these three teams, there's over uh, 40 different members across the teams, representing over about 30 institutions and over about 12 countries. But most of the work that I uh, do myself is really aided by my own students. So uh, in particular, uh, both Alex and Bailey Tedarenko, Calgary natives, uh, were my former PhD students. Alex is now down in uh, Lubbock, Texas as a NASA Einstein fellow, and Bailey recently moved to Montreal as a McGill Space Institute postdoctoral fellow. And I have a new student, Andrew Hughes, new for uh, a little bit, uh, who's uh, my current PhD student. So these days, most of us have heard about black holes from not just science, but general media. So this is a picture of Gargantua, the supermassive, or sorry, the enemy mass black hole, supermassive black hole uh, in the uh, movie Interstellar. And in fact, nowadays we've gone from pictures like this, which is a scientifically accurate depiction to actual images of supermassive black holes like I'll talk about. But what is a supermassive black hole? Well, at the centers of galaxies, there can be these objects. Now, here's a, the galaxy Centaurus A, which contains the nearest actively accreting, actively eating supermassive black hole. And I'll be talking about time scales and light scales somewhat interchangeably. We talk often in astronomy about the distance light travels in a year, a light year, which I will abbreviate with LT uh, whenever for light. And galaxies are often tens of thousands of light years large. Now, it turns out that if we go from an optical image to a radio image, we see a very different feature. We see what we call an astrophysical jet. Um, and we see that this jet is also stretching tens of thousands of light years. As a matter of fact, this is just a small scale jet in this source. There's an even larger scale jet that's even bigger. Now, all of this is coming from an object that is creating matter, eating matter, uh, from a disk that is probably light days in length or smaller. So you're talking about something being affecting light years, tens of thousands of light years, when in fact something that's about 400,000 times smaller, sorry, 40,000 times smaller is actually at the cause of this. But that's actually not even quite true because that's just what's feeding the black hole. The actual black hole is even smaller. And these days we've started to make the very first pictures of the shadows of black holes. Um, and this is a picture from the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a collection of submillimeter observatories um, across the world that team together to make precision images of some of the most interesting black holes we can vis uh, visualize from Earth. M87 is 
farther away than Centaurus A galaxy, but it's one of these very super massive, super massive black holes. And ME7, or sorry, an Event Horizon Telescope is actually incredible because it allows you to see something that is essentially the equivalent of separating two hairs 200 kilometers away. And we're starting to see these incredible images of the shadows of black holes. And the scale that we're talking about for these images are something that astronomers call uh, a micro arc second, tens of micro arc seconds. And whenever I uh, often will uh, have micro, I'll use the symbol, Greek symbol for mu. It's just a quick way of doing an abbreviation. Now, a matter of fact, just last week, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope also gave a uh, image, presented an image of the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. This particular supermassive black hole isn't eating lots of material. It is daintily eating a little bit of material. And just by circumstance, it is less massive than M87, but it's closer so that you can actually make an image that's about the same angular extent on the sky for these, uh, for these objects. And we're going to be learning lots from these particular images, as well as how these images change with time. That's a talk for a whole nother uh, talk that I hope you get someone to talk about. The actual scales of these black hole shadows and what's feeding these things are much smaller than, you know, the uh, light days that I talked about, I told you light days. For M87, it's a super, super massive black hole. The scale here is about five light days, whereas uh, for Sagittarius A star, which is a much smaller supermassive black hole, is about 200 light seconds. Now, but it's actually incredible our ability to see objects that are 200 light seconds. And to give you an idea, the separation between Earth and our sun is about 500 light seconds. So the, one of the things that we'll be talking about here is things that are on the scale of our own solar system. But we can even think of smaller scales than 500 light seconds. What about the distance from the Earth to the moon? That's about 1.3 light seconds. Now, obviously, if we're just beginning to make images of uh, objects, uh, supermassive black holes that are 200 light seconds, this particular type of scale will be something that isn't possible for us to do yet. Matter of fact, if you took the M87 object or the Sagittarius A star object for that matter, either one of those objects would have to be about 320 light years away or closer for us to make an image that's on second uh, on the scale of light seconds. So it turns out that these black holes, exceptionally small objects, are having these huge results. I already showed you an image where the jet stretched for tens of thousands of light years, but it goes beyond just a huge scale for which they're applied. The image on your left is showing a way where we are comparing the mass of a black hole on the y-axis to the speed of stars far away from the black hole on the x-axis. And the details of this plot doesn't matter. What does matter is that there's a general relation. And because there's a general relation, what this tells us is that somehow stars and galaxies know about the supermassive black hole. This suggests that supermassive black holes and entire galaxies co-evolve which is just mind blowing. In addition, we can actually look at some of these jets. And so I'm showing a picture of one of these jets in red here, but in blue, we also see a picture of very hot gas taken by an X-ray facility. And what you can see is there are sort of holes in the X-ray gas and the blue gas that is being carved into by the jet, by the red emission here. And a matter of fact, this is in some ways the most energetic event since the Big Bang. I put event in air quotes because this event is actually occurring over very large timescales, tens of millions of years, but the total energy imparted is unbelievably large. And we can actually calculate this energy because a lot like blowing up a balloon, it's a, uh, you can actually calculate the energy of uh, how Quickly, how much energy it takes to blow up a balloon by looking at the change of volume? Well, we can do the same thing here. 
And so we know that black holes are affecting their environments. We see evidence that the jets are carving at least holes in the hot gas. And so it makes sense to think that jets might be important for affecting their local environments. And perhaps this is a way in which uh, it defines, not defines, uh, delineates how supermassive black holes could potentially inform stars far away from them that these small objects, relatively speaking, actually exist. Now, it turns out that these jets, and here I'm showing an X-ray image of the same Centaurus A galaxy. I like this image because it, it combines the ability to see the jet-like features and the lobes and the sort of green emission with the ability to see the dust lane that um, is blocking some of the optical and the X-ray light. But we see these jets from the supermassive black holes on tens of thousands of light years. If you go to something that's very different, if you go to a star that's being born, um, a protostar, we actually see something very similar. We see a disk of material and we see a jet. And now we're at light day uh, size scales. So it turns out that jets are a universal feature throughout the uh, universe. But we've known about these things now since the late 60s. We still don't know how it is that a black hole, which we know from our uh, science fiction type of things, oh, black holes suck everything in. Well, that's true, but only in a very, very small region around the black hole. Nevertheless, the fact that black holes are very compact does mean that you can extract a lot of energy potentially from black holes and that that energy that doesn't make it to the black holes uh, sort of plate among, from which it's gonna feast, that energy can get redirected into a jet. And there are two theories we have about how the energy and also the angular momentum, think about it as the spin, actually get extracted. It could be that the black hole itself is spinning and that gives you uh, uh, the ability to extract the information. It could be that there are magnetic fields embedded in the disk that's feeding the black hole. And that's how these things are attracted. Or it could be something completely different. And you can see that there are theories from the, from the late 70s, early 80s, and we still don't know the answer. So a lot of my, uh, a lot of my effort is based on trying to actually get at these answers. Don't have the answers yet. Hopefully by the end of my career, we will. But there's a problem with these supermassive black holes. In particular, their outbursts last millions of years to billions of years. And the last time I asked my graduate students whether they'd wait a million years to finish their thesis, they looked at me like I had grown two heads. So obviously, we're going to have to study something that evolves on a much quicker time scale. Fortunately, there aren't just supermassive black holes in our universe. There are also stellar mass black holes. And what happens at the end of a star's life when it can no longer burn any fuel to support itself against the gravity of itself, the most massive stars will collapse and nothing can stop their collapse. So the very massive stars will, after just a few millions of years, form stellar mass black holes. Now these stellar mass black holes, you can think about them as they're being dead stars. But it turns out that these dead stars can come alive again if they happen to have a nearby neighbor. And so when I study X-ray binaries, I like to call these one of the stellar undead. Um, sometimes I describe them as vampires. Sometimes I describe them as zombies, sometimes werewolves. It depends on the exact uh, type of X-ray binary. But they're all sort of objects that are coming alive because they're eating something nearby. And so in this case, you have a nearby star. And by nearby, the separation between the star and the black hole is only 40 light seconds. Remember, the separation between the Earth and the moon was 1.3 light seconds. So this is a star which is well within the distance between the Earth and the sun away from a black hole. The material is siphoned off due to gravity. And because of the way things tend to fall, it tends to form a flattened pancake object that we call an accretion disk. And at the very center of the black hole, some of the material is not making it all the way to the black hole's plate that it feasts upon. 
and instead it's getting ejected into these relativistic jets. It's, these relativistic jets are very highly focused. Some of the material is also getting ejected into more woofly winds, but I don't have time to discuss those in today's presentation. Also, extremely interesting astrophysical objects. Now, for a size scale, this particular object, the separation between the donor star and the black hole is 25 micro arc seconds. And if you remember the images I was talking about, for instance, for Sag star, well, that is 50 micro arc seconds. So this shows you an approximate size scale. And really, the image on the left is as good as we can do these days with the instruments we have. Yet we want to study the, the, the object on the right. And we don't just want to study the separation of the star and the black hole. We want to study all the details that are going on in that disk and everything that's being launched along that jet, which can also affect quite a large area. So we're going to have to do something different. I'd like you guys to keep that in mind. Now, these X-ray binaries, it turns out that they are emitting across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The donor star tends to be bright in optical and ultraviolet emission, like all stars tend to be bright. The accretion disk tends to be bright in X-rays and ultraviolet emission. The compact object, if it's a black hole, it's not uh, uh, emitting anything. If it's a neutron star, it's also fairly X-ray bright, potentially. But the relativistic jets themselves are often bright at radio to near infrared uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's going to be particularly interesting because there are less objects that are bright in those regimes. And so oftentimes when we look at the radio universe, a lot of that is dominated by relativistic jets, whether they're jets from X-ray binaries or jets from supermassive black holes. So we have to put on our multi-wavelength glasses. We can't just look at one little bit when we study X-ray binaries. And in particular, if we want to think about the jet, the closer we get to the black hole, the higher in frequency the mission that we have to study. So in theory, the part of the jet that is close to the black hole would be emitting in the x-rays, but the accretion disk is so bright that you're unlikely to see that emission. In the ultraviolet, eh, maybe, maybe not, but it's actually very hard for us to study in the ultraviolet. In the optical, you've got the stellar companion. So it's only once you start getting to the near infrared when the stellar companion tends to die down, and when you go into the lower and lower frequencies that you start to see these jets. And so if you want to study the jets as well as you can, as close as to where they're being created, you've got to go to fairly high frequencies and look at the mid infrared and the near infrared. Now, I said that one of the reasons why we want to study these X-ray binaries is because, well, they don't last millions of years and uh, their outbursts don't last millions of years and billions of years. Instead, their outbursts last days to months. And this is a radio image of the black hole X-ray binary system whose artistic rendition I've been showing you. And what you can see is there's a bright point in the middle that stays there most of the time. And there are these little blobs of material that come out. And on a time scale of days, you see these move out. These are what we call jet ejecta. And the entire feasting time of the black hole when it's bright in radio, when it's bright in X-ray, when it's eating a lot of the material that was from its disk can last days to months and in some rare cases years. But all those are very accessible timescales for graduate students and myself, because I'm not that patient either. So what we do as a community is we have to detect when the feeding frenzy begins. And so we have to monitor the entire sky in x-rays to detect the beginning of an outburst. And this is done with a variety of instruments in space, like the Swift X-ray Telescope or the monitor of the all-sky X-ray imager on the International Space Station. And these objects tend to tell us, oh, something went into outburst. And once that occurs, well, you get as many of your friends and colleagues together, and you try to look at it with a variety of telescopes. And when I say a variety of telescopes, it could be a moderate campaign where you're only involving six telescopes across the world that you have to try to get to coordinate. No big deal. Fairly big deal. It's a lot of work. Um, but it creates incredible science. And we can study them across the electromagnetic wavelength with a variety of facilities. 
So I'd like to talk first about one of these X-ray binaries, V44 Cygni. This object went into an incredible outburst in 2015, where it became one of the brightest objects uh, in the X-ray sky. The sun is always very bright, so it wasn't being the sun. But one of the things is over its outburst, where most of its outbursts only lasted about 10 or so days, and then it decayed for another uh, few weeks. You, we saw on the top axis, we see the X-ray emission. On the bottom axis, we see the optical emission. And we see huge amounts of variability. This is a logarithmic scale, which means that this object was varying on a factor of 10,000 in very rapid time scales. So the entire world, we tried to get as many observations as we could. One of my teams, the uh, uh, jackpot team, uh, we do a lot of imaging using a very similar technique to what the Event Horizon Telescope uses, but at lower frequencies. And we were able to get the uh, spots in pink and in blue here to look at the jet. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the spot in blue because we got multiple instruments to look at that. And in that time scale, we see not just extreme variability on sort of day time scales, we see extreme variability on minutes time scale. And this is, was an absolutely flabbergasting image when we made it. To see this type of variability, we just, we, we should have expected it, but we weren't. Um, and it's really redefining our view of what these black hole X-ray binaries are putting out in terms of their mission. Because most of the time when we studied just in the past, we focused on the radio mission, which is the much more sedate emission you see in Alberta golden green at the bottom. But it turns out we can do more than just study this timing, which allows us to get on light minute and potentially even faster time scales. We can still do imaging like EHT did. And a matter of fact, this is going to be a picture of the jet and the jet ejecta. And it's not just a picture. I mean, this would be a fairly boring picture. Why would I show you this? One of the ways in which the Vent Horizon Telescope and the very large baseline array that we use here, one of the ways in which it makes images it sort of relies on the fact that the image isn't varying. And it allows the Earth to rotate and help build up the picture it makes. But in order to do that, your object can't be varied. I just told you this is a very extreme amount. And so that forced us to make good images. That forced us to make very, very short images. And what do you call a bunch of short images? Well, that's a movie. And so we quickly made this movie. And even though we made this movie in 2015, it took us four years of painstaking checking to make sure we were doing everything right before we were actually able to publish the results. And what we saw really surprised us. So what you see at the center here is just a mission from a jet that we can't resolve out. You would need the Event Horizon Telescope or even better to see that out. But we're going to start, as we play the movie now, we're going to see ejecta pop out. So now you see an ejecta popping out. It's on the scale of milliard seconds which is still very, very small. Uh, if I recall, I'm doing this in my head, it's about a stop sign on the moon. Um, so milliard seconds is absolutely incredible. Now, we actually can watch this object go out, and that itself would be pretty cool. Except we don't just see one ejecta. We see multiple ejecta. And we don't just see one ejecta at one angle. We see multiple ejecta coming out at different angles. And granted, this is a bit of a movie that only a radio astronomer could love. But I can tell you that all of us were absolutely floored by this because the implications are huge. So this is what appears to be going on. So what I'm going to show you here is a scientifically informed artistic rendition with a movie of what's going on. So we have the jet blobs coming out. And they're coming out and they're changing direction. So what we think is going on is we think that you have a jet that is processing like a top processes uh, when it starts to slow down a little bit. But this is really weird because in order for this to be the way it is, it's not at the same angle as the accretion distance feeding it. As a matter of fact, something needs to be changing that angle very close to where the jet is launched. 
And so we think that we have this processing inner bit. And of course, the jet isn't just this continuous jet like I've been showing you, but these are these sort of episodic blobs that are coming out as well. And what we think about is that the inner disk is getting puffed up by a lot of uh, intense radiation. And it gets puffed up big. And it turns out that you can get that slightly to process. And we think that's what's going on. And if you were to study that at the very closest parts of the black hole, you would probably need to be studying that on the millisecond scales. So you'd now be studying something that is light milliseconds in size scale, probably. And no imager is ever going to be able to do that. Whoops. So we think this is, this is coming around. But why exactly is it processing? Well, this is where things get, go from weird to really weird. It turns out that a spinning black hole actually drags space time around it, something called lens steering precession. And we think this is one of the more direct evidences uh, to date for this lens steering precession. So just by studying this fast and furious black hole, we're already getting at things uh, that are really in the realm of general relativity uh, expectations from Einstein. And to show you the rough angular scale composition, I'll do that one more time. We go from what we thought about with uh, talking about the 50 micro arc second scale uh, and the few 200 light second scale of Sag star, the 30 light second scale of the black hole X-ray binary. All those would fit into just a few pixels of this image. So the imaging is doing nowhere near as much information as we're getting from seeing the variability. And variability gives us a way to actually get at things that we can never, ever do otherwise. And so I like to call this the deed for speed. And obviously, you need to be observing very fast if your size scale is 40 light seconds. Well, that means that things could vary on 40 second time scales. But the closer you get to the black hole, the, the shorter and shorter that's going to get. And as a matter of fact, if you want to go to the very horizon of the black hole, basically the plate from which it feeds, now you're talking about something that is below a few milli light seconds in size scale. Now, the other thing we can do is we can actually look at the material that's feeding the black hole in the x-rays, and we can look for variability in other regimes. So from this very same outburst, some other colleagues of mine looked at radio and or sorry, x-ray and near infrared. Oh, I was unable to pause it at the right time. And there would be an x-ray burst of emission, a little burst of emission. And then about 200 uh, milliseconds later, they'd see a burst of near infrared emission. And so this is getting now at you know hundreds, uh, less than a, a tenth of a second type of time scales. And this variability starts telling us about where particles are first accelerated in these jets. And it's not just something that you're going to do at x-rays looking what's feeding and looking at the burps, these black holes. You're going to do it, and you're going to look at the entire jet if you can. And so that's what we actually do. So in another one of these um, attempts to put together multiple telescopes, we put together a mere six telescopes again, and we were working at a different outburst, an X-ray binary called Maxi J1820 plus 070 that was discovered just in 2018 when it went to outburst for the first time during the history of at least X-ray astronomy. And that outburst lasted for about eight months. And then it's gone into a couple of outbursts over and over again. It's a very intriguing source. But we're going to zoom in a little bit of time. Nope, we're going to zoom in a little bit more of time. We're going to zoom in on a few hours in this outburst. And the information we get from a few hours is, in my mind, absolutely jaw dropping. So, what we have here is x ray information talking about the accretion disk. We have optical near infrared emission that's talking about the very base of these jets. And then we have some submillimeter and radio emission that's talking about jets material from further out. And what we could do is we can compare the variability on all these time scales. Now, unfortunately, we have holes. And of course, we have holes just when we have the best radio data 
is when we have holes in the x-ray and the optical. So it became a little bit harder to do. So we're just gonna concentrate uh, for the purpose of this talk on comparing the radio to itself. And so this is what the two different, two different radio observations at nearby frequencies, nearby wavelengths saw. And by eye, you can see that, ah, these things look very similar, but the orange curve, the 11 gigahertz curve looks a little bit delayed. So we can play a game and we don't do this like I'm gonna do now by shifting graphs. We do this all with computer programs, but we can shift the time until we go, hey, wait a minute, that looks right. This is a technique called cross correlation. And when we do this, we find out that the time lag between the 12 millimeter and 27 millimeter data is five minutes. So we're getting at data that is probably separated in, in scales on the order of a few light minutes of, uh, of distance. All right, so what can you do with these time lags? Well, this is what we think might be going on. So I want you all to imagine a jet. And in astronomy, we tend to often simplify things as much as possible. So we often simplify jets. We'll just concentrate on one jet. There are normally two jets going in two directions. And we simplify them as a cone. And at different frequencies, we're observing different parts of the jet. The lower in frequency we look, the higher in wavelength we look, the farther from where the jet is launched is. So at some time, which we're going to call the time of the ejecta, we launch a blob. And we see that in the uh, 0.81 microns. Then a little bit later, in the submillimeter, we'll see the peak from that. Then the 12 millimeter, the 14 millimeter, the 27 millimeter, and so forth. So you have all these different time scales. Now it turns out that you can actually then say, well, the difference between any two is related to the time that it was ejected to the time we observed it uh, at each of those pairs. And so basically all the different pairs of frequencies tells us information about what's going on in here. And so the delays between bands tell us about the speed of the jet and combined with some other information from these same uh, properties, we're actually able to look at other jet properties. So what can we tell? Well, in this case, the jet fluid is moving at about you know, 95 to 98% the speed of light. No big deal. Just the fastest jet the black hell x-ray binary observed to date. Or at least the compact study jets. Now, what else can we tell? Well, it turns out, you know, I said that conical model that we all sort of, you know, simplify things in? Probably not right. We can already start to tell that. I told you guys that jets are focused, but oftentimes I've shown you fairly unfocused jets compared to this jet. This is a very highly confined jet. The opening angle is likely probably only around a degree. So it's almost like a laser beam, not as far as a sort of a pencil beam. And we can do things like measure how much power is in this jet. And in human units, it's 600 trillion trillion watts, a number none of us could ever really fathom. But what's actually surprising to astronomers is that that's about 6% of the luminosity that's actually being output uh, it, by the accretion disk. So this is saying about one part in 20 of the energy that is uh, otherwise getting released when it's flowing on the black hole is getting released in something else. And so we can see evidence that a large amount of material that would otherwise fall in the black hole can be uh, quite energetic. Now, what I've shown you guys up to now, when I've shown you this picture, I've shown you without all the data that went into this picture. Matter of fact, this was taken when fortunately we had a mid-infrared telescope that just happened to observe one of these outbursts. It wasn't planned really well. And from that, we were able to understand the relationship between the radio to the mid red, but we only did that connecting two points. And sure, you can connect any two points with a line. So one of the things we need to do is we need to fill in this gap. But in particular, that mid red is a very critical gap because it's as close as we get to the black hole without really having to worry about the stellar companion. Well, what just got launched with mid-infrared capacity? James Webb Space Telescope. So why would we care about James Webb Space Telescope as someone who studies jets? 
Well, the wavelength covers from about 0.6 microns to 29 microns. So what we view as green light and red light, but more importantly, near infrared light and that all important mid infrared. James Webb Space Telescope is also critical because those huge 6.5 meter uh, uh, diameter in total of mirrors allows us to capture lots of light. And when you capture lots of light, that means if you look at a very, very small fraction of time, you can still see objects. And so if you want to study something that's varying very quickly, you want a big telescope. Now, perhaps the most noteworthy part of the James Webb Space Telescope design has nothing to do with the, uh, the science that we want to do. Instead, it's how we actually enable the science. James Webb Space Telescope and all mid-infrared telescopes, you really need to be as cool as possible. And one of the best ways of doing that is to get far away from a thermal object like the Earth. And so this is why JWST orbits uh, so far away from Earth. And at the same point, you also are going to need these very large, very uh, striking sun shields to make sure that the mirrors and the detectors stay as cold as possible. So where is James Webb Space Telescope currently? What's it currently doing? Well, everything has gone probably beyond our best expectations. So this is a relatively uh, recent image which shows all the different instruments on James Webb after we've gone through the focusing the mirrors, aligning the mirrors, getting everything just right. And these images, for an astronomer are drop dead gorgeous. Now I also will note that among these four uh, instruments, because we really, the five guidance sensor and nearest were generated together. One of those was generated, was, uh, was created by Canada. So Canada has an active role in James Webb Space Telescope because of this instrument. I'm actually not gonna focus on the image from these instruments. I'm gonna show the image in the upper right, the MIRI, because it's got this wonderful comparison to mid-infrared telescopes of the past that I will get back to, I will show now. And so there was a telescope relatively recently that did a, a survey of the entire sky in infrared, and that was the WISE telescope. And it made this image, which isn't that great uh, when you compare it to the JWST image, but it's actually incredible when you think you did it over the entire sky. Before JWST, the best mid-infrared instrument was the Spitzer, and it made some very nice images, but they're nothing compared to what we can do with the very large mirrors from JWST, which allow us to collect lots of light and to see very fine detail. So where is JWST currently? What's it currently doing? Well, we're in the very last step before we get science done. We're in basically the modes where we're going through and we're getting all the instruments commissioned. And so, we had the four, four main instruments, and then we have all the different modes in which they're going to be used. Unfortunately, what this should show eventually is all these things with nice gold uh, outlines which say that they've all been completed. We've just really are still in the beginning of this. This is going to take several months. But JWST and NASA put together this wonderful explorer for the entire launch and all the steps up until now and this, where you can actually trace what's going on. Heck, this is how I keep it up to date of what's going on. So I've said that JWC could be a critical gap, but there's a problem. As design, JWC only keeps its time accurate to two seconds over 40 hours. And then it gets a signal back from the ground that says, oh, you know, you need to reset your clock. Oh, you need to reset your clock. And as you all know, whenever you have to reset your clock, oh, that's a pain in the butt. You don't know the time in between that. Now it's great because JWC was designed this way because there's a huge amount of science you can do at longer time scales than a few seconds. But it turns out that JWC will take data much more quickly by its very design. And whenever you give an astronomer say, I'm taking the data as quick as possible, but I'm not so sure how, how well I know the data. So um, the servers are gonna come along and they're gonna say, maybe we can be intelligent and we can reclaim some of that accuracy. And so I'm part of a group that's trying to open up the sub second regime for JWST. And this will give us information, not just about the stellar and dead jets and disks that I talked about in this talk, but it also will give us interesting things, for instance, for looking at 
occultations of solar system objects of distant stars. And timing that very precisely gives us very, a lot of information about our own solar system. And we can even start getting into some of the rapid oscillations and pulsations in compact objects like neutron stars, which are the scales of city sizes. Absolutely phenomenal what we could potentially do. So how are we going to do this? Well, we need a clock. And the clock on JWST isn't quite good enough. So we're going to use nature's clocks. And in particular, there, there's a wide range of nature's clocks that we considered. And we decided that systems that orbit around one of each other and undergo what's called a double eclipse, in particular, very small objects, white dwarfs, would allow us to reduce the timing errors from two seconds to a tenth of a second, and potentially even lower, depending on how good the instruments are, because JWST really didn't look at that regime. So we've got we've got scientists that we're going to do these observations. And if we're able to do this, we will create not just for our own science, but for the entire community, a new regime with JWST. And the goal for JETS in the JWST error is to basically take X-rays, optical, near-infrared, mid-infrared, submillimeter, and radio, and simultaneously observe that as high speeds as possible, so that we're making not just these movies at one object, not just these comparisons between two, but across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And if we do that, that's going to dramatically drive discovery. So what have I talked about today? I talked a little bit about jets before and in the JWST error. So if you come out with just a few ideas, one is the idea that black holes, they don't just suck. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about this probably in some of the questions. The area from which black holes suck is very, very small. And as long as you're outside of that area, you can actually drive outflows. And these outflows appear to shape their environments. Supermassive black holes do it. And as a matter of fact, these X-ray binaries do it on smaller scales. Despite knowing about jets for over 50 years now, maybe a little bit less depending on when you think we discovered them, we don't know how they're launched. And hopefully, we've seen the JWST error, we might get significant steps to answering this, potentially even answering this. Fingers crossed, but uh, Murphy says you answer one question, not Murphy. A trainer says you answer one question, you open two more. In particular, since we have very small size scales for structures outside of black holes, that means that the material there tends to be changing very rapidly and you get very fast behavior. And this fast pay, uh, behavior allows us to probe science that imaging cannot do. Although I'm not going to say don't do images. Images like what EHT did, images like what we did certainly help. And they sometimes inform the non-imaging uh, analysis. This fast behavior can be amazingly furious. It drives very high speed outflows, some that are piddly a few a tenth to a few tenths the speed of light, but others that are near the speed of light. And it creates very large and very rapid brightness changes. And if you're going to be interested in following JWST in its final stages of deployment, I've uh, put up the link here for that wonderful little web app that will let you trace that. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to start answering questions that will be uh, that Simon and others will MC. Great, thank you very much um, for that amazing, amazing lecture. Uh, I will start with uh, a question on the Q and A. And if anybody here in the theater has any questions, please put up your hand, and uh, we'll have somebody come by with a microphone to ask your question. So I'll start by. Um, uh, with the with the Q and A, uh, what drew you to study black holes, and why are they worthy of study? Okay, so frankly, black holes are cool. Um, you know, it was that that draws me to it. But there's also a lot of uh, serendipity here. It turns out that the very very first university physics teacher studied. Uh, a type of supermassive black hole when these jets that points directly at you called a blazer. And I did well in, in his course, and he asked me whether I'd be interested in doing research with them. And so I just happened to, to, to get caught in something that I was very interested in. In particular, I was always interested in astrophysics from undergraduate on, because my dad once pointed out that there's a lot of room in space to make discoveries. 
I'm like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so why are black holes important? Well, I just gave you some of the reasons, for instance, why super, how supermassive black holes may in fact uh, shape how entire galaxies form. There are other reasons. It turns out that you and I are largely made of stardust. And these stars occur in uh, the star of dust that we are made of either got launched in winds at the end of the star lives star the star lives, or in supernova explosions. And those supernova explosions can lead to either neutron stars or black holes or sometimes nothing at the end. And so black holes act as sort of a uh, almost a paleontologist view of of astronomy. They're sort of the the the, the records of these massive stars that were uh, eventually were made of. Now the next question uh, on uh, next other thing is, and I, I'm obliged to say this, I'm from Alberta, many of you are as well. Well, it turns out that they're very good at uh, converting energy. They're the best energy converters in the universe. Um, they put uh, they, they put anything else to shame. I have entire slides about that, but those are some of the reasons why black holes I think are important of study. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. And do we have a question in the audience there? We do. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is about what are the uh, three most uh, nearest uh, black hole to our planet, the, the Earth? Okay, so the nearest black holes that we know about are uh, black hole X-ray binary systems that are about a few thousand light years away. Um, they've got names that very few of you would recognize. AO620, um, there are a couple others. Uh, before 4 sig, it's actually relatively close by. Um, but it turns out that we're actually probably not seeing at least a factor of 100, if not 1,000 uh, 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 of the actual black holes in X-ray binary type systems. And we're missing the on order of 10 to the 8 uh, solar mass black holes in our own galaxy. And so it is quite likely that there are some isolated black holes that we don't know about and may never know about that are closer. I wouldn't say that this is anything to get worried about. I am not concerned about an intermediate batch black hole going through our solar system like they did in interstellar. Um, but uh, those are all relatively nearby. I'm sorry I can't give you the exact ones. To be honest, I should know them, but I just don't remember all their names. <laughs> I don't think most people would recognize them. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Is Sagittarius? Uh, okay, so Sagittarius A star is the nearest supermassive black hole. Sagittarius A star is at about 26,000 ish light years away, if I recall. Um, it turns out that even though we talk to the public in light years, Astronomers think in another uh, unit called a kiloparsec or called a parsec. Um, and so I have to do the conversion in my head every time. So Sagittarius star is the nearest supermassive black hole. For, um, unless something really weird. No, it's the nearest black hole, supermassive black hole. Great. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for that question. I uh, just want to remind the users online, if you have a question, uh, put it into the Q&A and it will come up on my screen. I'll be able to ask Dr. Sivakov your your question, so thank you. Uh, could you explain the gas that escaped uh, Sagittarius A star? Sure, so let me go to the image of Sagittarius A star because, and let's not use that one since that one is fading. Yeah, you might have to, you might have to share your screen again. Oh, okay, I apologize. I thought it was still sharing. Give me a second. Too many screens. <laughs> All right, so Sagittarius A star is a around a four million solar mass black hole. A four million solar mass black hole will have an event horizon that is on the order of twelve million kilometers. Now that seems like that's a really uh, a, a really big size, but in fact it actually isn't that big a size. Um, and so it turns out that the event horizon in this image is uh, a little bit smaller than the shadow that's getting made at the center of this image. 
And anything that, if, if you think about the Earth orbiting around the sun, we're not getting closer to the sun just because we're orbiting around the object. So a lot of the gas that orbits around Sagittarius A star will do so for quite a bit of time. It may eventually make its way in, but uh, it's going to last there for a long time. Now, some of that material is not going to make it in. And there are two reasons why it may not make it in. One are these jets that I've been talking about. But what's probably going to prevent more gas from uh, not getting in are actually the wind. The wind is a, like I said, it's sort of a fluffy thing. It's not uh, a very narrow, uh, very collimated object. And it can be surprisingly difficult to study. Um, so we think that there are winds, and we have evidence that there can be quite a lot of mass loss from the disks that feed black hole and the uh, uh, compared to the material that eventually does make it onto the black hole itself. OK, thank you very much. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? We do. Great. Um, how many black holes have been discovered, and how do we discover them? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm going to say by, I don't know how many black holes have been discovered, because one of the main ways that they've been discovered re most recently is with gravitational wave detectors. It's the brand new way of detecting black holes. And the LIGO group is very, very good at not telling us stuff until it's past embargo. So there are probably black holes that other scientists know about that I don't. But among the black holes that we know about, there are about 75-ish black hole X-ray binaries or suspected black hole X-ray binaries. I say 75-ish because some of them are just candidates and they may in fact host neutron stars and not black holes. And the number changes over time. The number of black hole uh, systems where we know that there's a black hole in, the, in them from an X-ray bio perspective is only around 20-ish. And it turns out that now the number of black holes that we know exist from gravitational waves outnumber them. Now, they do a nice little trick because they're discovering them by the black holes, two black holes spinning in and eventually merging. So they claim three black holes for every discovery they make. Um, but it's still uh, it's absolutely incredible stuff. And so the, the two main ways we find out about these black holes is we either see emission from material outside of the event horizon, like we see in either these black hole shadow images or in the X-ray binaries, whether it's the accretion disk or the jets, or we see their gravitational wave signature. And right now, gravitational wave signatures are very good at detecting sort of stellar, two stellar mass size, a little bit larger than the stellar mass size, black holes merging. And in the future, increased uh, sensitivity and some space-based gravitational wave detectors will be able to start looking at the supermassive black holes doing a very similar dance. That's really cool. Um, it's a perfect segue into our next question. Um, speaking of LIGO, uh, does a spinning black hole create gravity waves? If so, are they large enough to be detected by LIGO? So I, I will admit that my frame time dragging knowledge is not sufficient to tell me that they would be detected. I don't think they would be. Frame time dragging is, uh, is largely what occurs from a spinning black hole. And we have some evidence of it. But the amount of frame time dragging doesn't tend to uh, affect things very far away. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong here, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that frame time dragging actually creates a gravitational wave. Um, that is good. And I'm very sure that's not going to be detectable. I think what, what you tend to get more information from is when you have the black holes orbiting one another. So we've, we, we've seen the black holes orbiting and the final ring down when they, they, they merge with these stellar mass black holes. We are able to infer how fast and what direction the black holes are spinning from the exact details of that very last ring down 
but it's only in those last those last bits of information that you get that. So I pretty much think that a isolated spinning black hole will not be detectable by LIGO or LISA, but I could be wrong. Interesting, yeah, I thought LISA might might be able to, to rein that in, that's, that's fascinating. LISA um, will be able to look at supermassive black holes orbiting one another, but I think an individual supermassive black hole spinning, it probably won't. Okay, um, maybe just for the for the audience's um, um, uh, knowledge, do you just want to mention what LISA is? Sure. So let me take a step back and talk about what LIGO is. So LIGO is a detector that is detecting gravitational waves, and it does this by measuring distance by, by measuring basically change very 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 small changes of distance. Um, in a technique called interferometry, much like the radio astronomers and the people that did the uh, these incredible event horizon telescopes images use, uh, they're very complementary. And so LIGO has the ability to sort of see, I think, changes in sort of basically the very metric of, of what's going on that are less than the scale of a hair. I think it's less than 200th scale of a hair. And so this is based on basically uh, sort of a light signal that gets bounced back and forth along arms that are a few kilometers. What you want to do to get more sensitivity, uh, you want to have bigger, longer arms. And it's really, really difficult to do that on Earth. The Earth curves, there are all sorts of other things. Heck, one of the LIGO facilities, um, all of them, but one of the LIGO facilities is fairly close enough to a road that they can actually tell when trucks are going by. Like, <laughs> the sensitivity is unbelievable. Yeah. And so you're going to have to build really, really big um, uh, gravitational wave detectors. And so the answer is, rather than build really big gravitational wave detectors, why don't you make them very far separated? And since the Earth is curved, well, you can't do this on the ground, so you're going to have to go into space. So LISA is basically the space-based version of LIGO on steroids. Yeah, Sound, sounds about right. Um, just want to turn back to the audience. Is there another audience question? So thank you for uh, the wonderful lecture. So I have a question about the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, the pictures which we have for the two uh, black holes. So for uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, it appears that the, the, the bright uh, part is one continuous part, whereas for Sagittarius A star, it's three bright disconnected things. So is there something fundamentally different about these two black holes or it's just because of our observation technique? So I will be honest, this image is so new that I have not been able to delve into the very details of this. Um, from what I understand, there are some fundamental differences and that this is not an imaging artifact. These three, uh, three bright spots are in fact real and they do reflect the detailed um, differences between Sag A star and M87 star. And there are a whole bunch of different possibilities. And moreover, these possibilities are not just a single time. These, these things can potentially change. And like, not like, ESG is already looking at these changes. And so there are some, there are some differences. Now, I don't, if I recall, it has nothing to do with the mass difference because these are very different in mass. Billion time, billion solar mass objects versus million solar mass objects, M87 versus Sag A star. There are some differences in terms of um, how the spin axis of the black hole is oriented for, uh, compared to us. Um, and that will lead to some differences. That also leads to the difference, for instance, from uh, the image you see uh, for interstellar, where you see the line going across the black hole shadow. Well, that's actually a material in front of the black hole. Um, so we're not seeing, uh, we're not quite seeing um, some aspects of, of, of that uh, in the shadow either. Uh, so there are some intrinsic differences. I will also say that this imaging is exceptionally difficult. They've really done uh, incredible work to, to do this. They've done multiple techniques to verify that they're not being forced into something based on some assumption they're making. Um, so there are going to be these. There are going to be minor differences from the images that aren't significant, but the bulk things you see here, I think, will remain significant. 
great, thank you. Uh, here's another question from online. Uh, can black holes shrink? Okay, so the question was, can black holes shrink? The volume went a little bit low there. And so the answer is yes, black holes can shrink. Now this is one of the very weird things, and this is what Hawking really got famous for, um, is this something called black hole evaporation. And there's some weird aspects that has to do partially with how quantum mechanics works. Um, and so it turns out that black holes don't just take stuff from their event horizon. It is possible that because a, a virtual particle will pair, will, will be created due to quantum mechanics, and one of them will fall into the black hole, the other one will be free. That is essentially emitting something. And so the black hole loses mass. Now, it turns out that uh, the more massive you are, the slower the rate of the black hole evaporation. So the black hole evaporation in astrophysical black holes that we know about, the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes is really not significant. And I'd go out on a limb here and say that they're much more likely to accrete other matter to offset that before you ever got them evaporating. Now, on the other hand, it is thought that primordial black holes exist, black holes formed at the very beginning of the universe. And these black holes may be only as massive as mountains, not stars. And in this case, they're small enough that some of these objects could in fact be evaporated. And so this is evaporation is also known as Hawking radiation. And had we been able to get proof of Hawking radiation, observational proof while Stephen Hawking was alive, that's what he would have won the Nobel Prize for, our, in my opinion. Um, so yes, black holes can evaporate, but until we find primordial black holes, I'm a I'm American empiricist. It's a theory right now. It's not something that we've been able to prove yet. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, for that answer. Uh, we have another question here in the audience. Hello. Uh, great uh, talk tonight. But um, yeah, the idea of the creation of uh, polar jets from black holes, how does that relate to uh, powerful jets from magnetic neutron stars or magnetars? How What's the creation of those jets in relation to black holes? So, so this is a great question. So I talked about the universality of jets. And the, 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 if I break down the universality, it's that when things collapse, not everything tends to collapse. Some things also get emitted. And they often get emitted along the spin axis of objects. Now. So the, the fact that there are jets, this is why you can imagine you get jets in, in, in stars that are forming because they're in the process of collapsing. You can get jets in supermassive black holes and black holes. You can also get jets in different types of neutron star systems. Neutron stars are the lower mass cousins of black holes. They had just enough mass that weird quantum mechanical effects went on twice such that, um, an object that is about the mass of a star, but the size of a city gets formed. And some of these objects can be quite highly magnetized. And the magnetized neutron stars are abbreviated as magnetars. Some of these magnetars are isolated. Some of the magnetars are not isolated. For magnetars that aren't isolated, I view them very much like I view every other X-ray binary. They're very much similar, but that magnetic field is gonna make a difference. And one of the things that I actually study is I try to understand how neutron star X-ray binaries and how black hole X-ray binaries differ. And we think it's quite possible that the fact that neutron stars have a high magnetic field may make some changes. The fact that neutron stars have a surface may make some changes. Now, the question is, how might that, what might those changes be? There's a lot of theories out there, but the, uh, but the honest answer I would say is that we don't know. We have to go out and we have to empirically test what those differences are. I suspect that a lot of the same physics is in play here, but it's the that neutron stars are going to be more complicated than black holes. Black holes are the simple objects out here. Great. Um, here, here's a here's a question from you from online. 
Um, have you a rough idea when the first science images taken by the James Webb Space Telescope will be released? And when do you hope to have James Webb Space Telescope time to further your research? So there are different times for, for, for some of the first science-based images. They, I, I, my prediction is that it'll still be at least a couple of months. Um, I, I suspect that there's going to be, they're going to be, they give you a range of four and a half to seven months for sort of the, 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 the uh, checking out all the instruments. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on a limb here that the seven and a half months is the pessimistic view. Um, and so I expect that there'll be science information sooner. Now, to be fair, the images that they've already released, I am sure that there are people already doing science on. So this idea of science images, um, we, we, we like to hedge our bets as scientists as saying, oh, we're just commissioning the instruments, but I'm sure that someone is trying to do some type of science with them. So in some ways they've already been reduced, but what are, what are people actually going to be doing? Uh, what is going to be turned over to the sort of the scientists in general? I'm guessing that that's more like in about three or so months is my guess. The timing changes a little bit and, you know, I, I, I purposely have tuned out the timing so I don't get overly anxious. Um, now, the other question is when, when will I be getting JWC time? Well, I'm part of this JWC JESS project. And we actually got two proposals approved for this very first cycle, this first year of or so of observations. Um, and one of them is the actual calibration project. And then we actually hope to do science with that technique. Um, for B, we, we were bold, we said, we're gonna propose to do them both at the same time, because we're pretty darn sure we're gonna be able to get at least uh, to the regime where this is gonna be interesting, if not, ground, uh, if not groundbreaking. And so they have rough time scales for when these observations might occur. Again, I, I, I do a lot with these transient objects that things go on in space. And so I've learned to never expect any schedule and to just sort of be happy when the when they tell me they need work done, I'll do work. That's great, thank you. Uh, do we have another question in the audience? Great. Hi, great presentation. Uh, my question is: is uh, you mentioned the super massive, massive black holes? Obviously, you have a huge life cycle that we can't uh, really follow, but uh, with the new technology, are we able to find uh, supermassive black holes already in the late stages? And if so, um, how do we plan on finding them of their end life cycle of a supermassive black hole? So I, I want to be, when I, be a little bit careful here. When I talk about these outbursts, it's not that the supermassive black hole is going to go away. It's that the supermassive black hole will go through two stages. The, uh, I, I like to call them the feeding frenzy and the dainty eating. So the Saturday starts the dainty eater. MA7 is the feeding frenzy. And there is evidence that Sag star has gone through some activity of feeding frenzy in the past. And so there are some short cycles of this activity, but then there are these very long cycles like MA7 is going through. And most of the very long cycles will go on for probably millions to billions of years, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of the short end, maybe even faster. Um, but what happens at the end is that they go from being a feeding frenzy to being a dainty eater. And then something will change potentially, and they'll go from being a dainty eater to being a feeding frenzy. So the supermassive black holes aren't going to go away. Now, we still study supermassive black holes, even though they evolve on very long time scales, there is an advantage. There are lots of supermassive black holes. To first order, we think that there may be a supermassive black hole in nearly every moderate sized galaxy. And so there are millions of supermassive black holes that we know about. So this means that we are studying supermassive black holes at all aspects of their life cycle. And there's a type of these objects, one of them that's a very interesting type that's called a changing look quasar. And this is an object that is actually changing its look on human timescales. And these objects are thought to be very similar to the way black hole binaries change their look 
during a feeding frenzy. Um, and so there's a lot of great stuff going on. So it's not that you can't get at human timescale variability in supermassive black holes. You absolutely can. The size scales get very small, and so you're going to have rapid variability. It's just that if you want that holistic picture, you either need to try to make it from these millions of objects, and you don't know exactly where in the life cycle they all are. So you have to do this either statistically, but if you want to do an empirical uh, sort of uh, control on this, as much control as astronomers have, that's why you have the stellar mass black holes. If you can't tell, I'm an empiricist. I very much want to see what's going on because I'm constantly surprised by what's going on. Oh, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, as somebody mentions online, I, I don't think I heard you mention gamma rays. Are, are they relevant in your studies or observations at all? Oh, they, they absolutely are. Um, so gamma ray astronomy is much more difficult to do than X-ray astronomy. And so that is one of the reasons why I didn't talk about it as much. Um, in other ways, it's also fairly similar to X-ray astronomy. There are differences, but it's got a lot of similarities. And so there are some type of X-ray binaries, which are gamma ray bright objects. And being the inventive namers we are, we call them gamma ray binaries. Um, so there are a collection of these gamma ray binaries. There are a few X-ray binaries that are still called X-ray binaries, but also are gamma ray bright. Um, there are a few objects where during these outbursts, they become very bright gamma ray objects. So V44 SIG was a bright gamma ray object um, during that time. Now, there are other types of bright gamma ray objects. In particular, a lot of the supermassive black holes can be bright gamma ray objects. And so gamma ray astronomy can play a key role there. And in particular, um, there are these objects called blazars, which are supermassive black holes where the jets are pointed almost directly at us. And because of that, lots of strange boosting effects due to special relativity occur. And a lot of these blazars are gamma ray objects, gamma ray bright objects. And so a lot of the gamma ray uh, sky is dominated by supermassive black holes. Oh, that's great. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? As you're discovering all the black holes and our technology is making it more available to us, does it, how much of the, um, the, the dark mass equation does, can the black holes possibly account for in terms of the undiscovered mass of the universe? So this is a great question. And, 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 and when, when, Astronomers first talked about, uh, and particle physicists first talked about dark matter, they had these two basic ideas of what it might be. It might be these weakly interacting uh, massive particles, uh, WIMPs, and massive here is for a particle, they're massive. Or it could be these massive compact halo objects, machos. Well, macho was a shorthand for things like black holes, brown dwarfs, other objects that are not particularly bright in radiation, but would still have a gravitational effect. And there were extreme efforts to try to disentangle whether dark matter was dominated by machos or whips. And so for instance, one group would look at the bulge of our galaxy through the bulge of our galaxy to the Magellanic, uh, to, uh, sorry, there's different bounds. They look through our galaxy to things like the Magellanic clouds, they look through our, through our Boulder galaxy towards far distant stars, and they try to constrain how massive objects could be that were uh, adding to this. And if I recall properly, they tended to rule out that machos down to about the mass, of, I think it was the moon, uh, are, are, are unlikely to be dominating what is the dark matter signal. And so we really think uh, that it's the WIMPs that are, are responsible for the dark matter. And so these days, a lot of the effort on dark matter is on the particle physicist side or on the indirect detection side of astronomy to try to find these things that would be coming from things like WIMPs. Uh, I don't know the precise current limits on this. In general, we have a pretty good idea for the upper limit of stellar mass black holes. 
And that's because we know stellar evolution fairly well. And, you know, I'm an astronomer, so fairly well is an order of magnitude. Um, and so we're fairly confident about the number of stellar mass black holes. I think there might be some questions in terms of, you know, how many very small black holes, but you need a lot of very small black holes to do it. So I don't think that one is likely either. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, and that, that's a good segue into uh, what I just wanna, we, ha we have some more questions that we'll, we'll ask, but I just want to remind everybody about our, our lecture here next month. And that will be specifically on dark matter and dark energy um, given by Sophia Nasser from the University of California, Irvine. And she will be flown in here um, to come to, to the Calgary Public Library here and to give, give a great talk. And I just wanna remind everybody, we'll have lots of great stuff to give away. And for those online, if you wanna come down to the library, you're more than welcome to, to come here, but we will also have it um, online as well. So uh, I'm going to move to another uh, question from our online audience. And the question is, why is the accretion disk of black holes always flat? Why is it a disk and not a sphere that surrounds the black hole completely? So this is a very good question. And this is something that we see often in astronomy. And a lot of this has to do with the way objects tend to collapse. And so I think we many of us have been on ice and we've done the experiment where if we bring our arms in, we start spinning around quicker. So we know that there's a lot of spin, there's a lot of angular momentum involved. And so one aspect is, is, is we've got the spin. Now, the other aspect is that the matter that we're talking about here is collisional matter. So what could happen is as objects are coming in, you know, they can collide with one another. And if you ask what tends to happen, well, what tends to happen is if you have two things coming in, they're not likely to collide and form something that's going to boost both objects. Statistically, you're more likely to get things that come in and because they come in, their linear momentum is stopped. And so they basically can sort of stop there or they're slower. And so over time, a lot of collapsing objects, accretion disks, um, tend to be flat. And how flat they are, you can get into arguments with astronomers. We have slim disks, thin disks, thick disks, uh, all sorts of disks, and they're all very flat uh, from, from, from most perspectives. But accretion disks also form, for instance, our solar system. So you, our, all the planets in our solar system orbit around roughly the same uh, plane because they formed out of the accretion disk that was formed in a very similar process. So it's one of these very fundamental things that when things collapse, they tend to, they tend to lose their um, sphericity. It's not to say that you can't have spheroidal accretion. There is a type of accretion that is spheroidal. It's called bondi hoyle accretion after the two astronomers who thought about it, or at least published about it first and maybe even didn't publish about it first, but published about it in English journals first. Um, and, and so you can have this type of uh, accretion, but it is much, much more common that you have uh, accretion through disks. Okay, no, that's, that's great. Thank you for that answer. Uh, do we have another question from our audience? Which was the first black hole in our solar system? So uh, we haven't found a black hole in our solar system yet, but we have found black holes in our own galaxy. And you could ask a couple different questions. You could ask sort of which is the first black hole that formed. You could ask the question, which is the first black hole that we, well, we discovered? And so I'll answer both. So my guess is the black hole or black holes that first formed are that are not primordial black holes, but the sort of the more massive ones are more likely to be things that got conglomerated into what is Sag A star now than they are to be a lot of the uh, a, 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 a lot of the uh, uh, black hole X-ray binaries, for instance, that we know about. It is very possible that some of the black holes that exist out there formed uh, uh, from the very first stars. These things were called uh, population three stars in astronomy. 
they're thought to get very massive and potentially form very massive black holes. So they're, they're thought to be potentially different in nature than the, uh, than the stellar mass black holes. And it's thought potentially that these intermediate mass black holes might collide, might accrete matter and grow into supermassive black holes. So in some theory, you know, the, the, the black hole or black holes that first formed might very well be, uh, that we know about at least, might be uh, related to Sagittarius star. The first black hole that we discovered is arguably a supermassive black hole um, in, uh, in, in a, uh, a galaxy where we saw a jet. And this was sort of the very beginning of people thinking, what could be so energetic to actually, uh, to actually uh, be the, uh, these things? And this was the birth of the quasars. The first black hole that we were pretty darn sure about, which is a third question, is one of these X-ray binaries. It is Cygnus X1. Um, there's a famous Rush song about it. There is a famous bet that Stephen Hawking lost based on this particular object. And what happened was we were able to see that there was a massive star. We were able to measure the mass of the star and the object it was orbiting around because we know orbits very well and we can measure things going back and forth using a technique called spectroscopy. And so we basically knew that there had to be, oh, I'm forgetting the exact numbers now. I want to say 40 total solar masses worth of objects here, but we could only see 15 solar masses of star. And so this discovery, um, once people started accepting it, was arguably the first discovery of a black hole that we believed we were sure was a black hole. There are some people that argue that M87 star, that image is the first uh, confirmed black hole. We can get into uh, friendly debates there. So I hope those answered some of your questions, but if you have others, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I noticed that at, on our on our question screen, um, it says, "Why is the date on the image showing 2017, but the date below is 2022?" Yes. So this data that EHT re released was taken in 2017. It takes years when you're doing the sort of the bleeding edge science and you want to do it right. It can take years to get it done correctly. So. In these two images that I have on my screen now, you see both of these were taken essentially in the same observing session, a, few, a week in April in 2017. M87, they were able to go through the analysis much quicker and release the results in 2019 because it turns out that Sagittarius A star varies more than M87. Now, if you remember what I said, the reason why we had to make a movie was because the fundamental assumption of how you make these images is that your object isn't varying. And because we are so close to Sagittarius A star, we see it in such phenomenal detail in terms of we can see relatively low activity levels changes. It turns out that Sag A star is much more active in terms of changes, even though it's a dainty eater. So it's a dainty but very sporadic eater compared to MA7, which is eating a lot at about the same rate all the time. And so it turned out that it was much, much simpler to make the image of MA7 star than it was to make the image of Sag A star. There were some of us who had our doubts whether the image from Sag A star would actually ever come out because it might've proven beyond the capacity of what we could do at the time. Um, so we're, so we're, we were very happy when we heard that they were going to release the results a result um, uh, this year, because everyone knew that, oh, if they're going to release the result, we know that it is Sag A star, 99% um, confidence. Um, and so we, we got very excited even before the, the, the press conference occurred. It was secret. Everyone knew that it was going to be announced, but they didn't get the image out at all. They were very, very good about their embargo. Great, thank you. Um... Any other audience questions? I think we may just have time for one more from the audience or one more from online. Is there anyone in the audience who has a burning question? 
Okay, I guess we can take one more from the uh, from the uh, Q and A there. Okay, great. Um, let me um, ask this question. Um, I'm going through to find a question here. Uh, question is, uh, where does a black hole get its spin? So, that, so this is a great question. Um, again, if we go back to that picture of, of you're on ice and you bring your arms in and you start spinning faster, this is very much how black holes are formed. They're formed in the collapse of something. And so whether it's the, it's the collapse of a, of a massive star, and it turns out in our universe, it is very difficult to have absolutely zero spin. So if you don't have absolutely zero spin, and if you started something big, and then you collapse to something very, very, very small, you're going to actually be very likely to have some type of spin. And so there was, there's, we, we thought that there are black holes are very likely to have spin. The question was what level of spin? Were they having very minimal spin so that mathematically you could basically call it zero? It's not precisely zero, but it's enough. Or were they spinning very rapidly? And so you have to use a different type of uh, general relativistic solution. And it turns out that there's probably a little from column A and a little from column B. Um, some black holes that we're seeing with LIGO do appear to be spinning fairly rapidly. Others are more sedate. I'm not sure we found anyone that is still 100% uh, coincident with zero. We probably have. I just have, don't. Uh, I'm not up to date on all their uh, their boundaries, but there's a whole range. But generally speaking, in astronomy, everything spins. It's just a question of how fast it's spinning. No, um, again, thank you very much. On, on behalf of the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Calgary Centre here, we're very grateful for the opportunity we have had to have you speak to us here this evening. And thank you, thank you very much um, for taking the, the time out of your evening to, um, to do so. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot and I think um, many people here who are in the theatre with us and online um, really enjoyed it. So. Thank you very much for, for being with us here this oh, evening. I'm very, I'm very happy for you guys to, to have me here. It was a pleasure.